Good morning everyone. Um, today you have a big day uh, on all .NET Core and uh, you're going to be led by uh, Brendan and Jason. Brendan and Jason have been running this tour for many, many years and uh, you know it's, it's a testament to .NET, uh, the .NET community that we've been able to keep running it uh, time after time. And um, th this course comes from our consulting. So all the guys in SSW, we try to make our enterprise apps the same structure. And uh, at a certain point, we decide to turn that into a course. Uh, originally, we started with a nine-week course, uh, and we, that was uh, hardcore. You did it, Ricardo, didn't you? OK. Um, <coughs> and then, um, then we uh, shortened it down, and we had a four-week course. And now, anyway, we, we put it all into a day, so hopefully you'll be able to uh, handle it. It will be fast. Um, uh, Jason and Brendan uh, spend their time doing, doing development, so they run large projects and uh, they're not actually trainers, uh, which is good and bad. Uh, and the, the good is that you're going to hear how it's really done in the real world. Um, and I can't even think of what the bad is, because um, Jason did a, a talk on this uh, uh, and put it up on, on YouTube, like we do this, we do user groups once a month. His particular talk uh, got over 200,000 views. In fact, it bumped off my awesome uh, Power BI talk, which was the leading talk for many years. Um, but that, how's that? A long, not a short video, like we have many short three minute videos. We're talking a hardcore over one hour video gets uh, more views than anyone. And if you search, uh, um, clean architecture, you'll find him before um, Mr. Bob Martin in some cases. I don't know about that. You should put that on your LinkedIn. <laughs> anyway, a little bit about us. Um, we build uh, enterprise apps in, in, on the Microsoft stack, most of it, mostly. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, all the other events running, if you just look down the, down the side here, you'll see all the events coming up. We also have a mobile app, and you might have installed it um, at a prior event or today. That little mobile app, you can collect some points off Jason and Brendan, and at the end of the course, you'll be able to scan that QR code, you'll get some more points as well. And uh, uh, Josephine will tell you how many prizes you can win, because I think she's cleaned out many prizes, but you've got bands and cups and uh, shirts and uh, even a, a Google Max. So that's all pretty cool. And the last thing I'll tell you is about SSW TV. There's heaps and heaps of um, videos on there. Who is already a subscriber of this? So, only a few. Okay, we have uh, over 20,000 subscribers. It's all free, it's all awesome content, and I think the, the quality of it is uh, pretty good, okay? So I'll leave you in their, their capable hands, and uh, we'll talk at lunch. Awesome, thanks Adam. Thank you Adam. So we've got a big agenda today, so we're gonna get started pretty quickly, because there's a lot to cover. In getting started, we show you how to get started. And what's great about .NET Core is you don't need much to get started. You don't need all these toolings. You don't need expensive IDEs. You can just get the, the SDK and run it on whatever computer you like and just start using it and edit text files. Then we're gonna go straight to automated testing. Um, we're gonna cover Open API, which is a great way of um, building those apps because quite often what we find is on the front side, we're building some kind of JavaScript single page application. And then the server side, we're actually using .NET to build our open API servers, so our REST um, servers. And so open API is a great way of documenting and providing a good interface to those servers. And we'll cover that in detail. Then a brief um, visit on um, how to perform server side validation. Before we get stuck into a big one, Entity Framework Core, which is all about getting our .NET code to talk to databases. Then, in the afternoon, we'll move on to um, various aspects of security. And then Blazor, which is my favorite new feature in .NET, and we'll cover that in detail. SignalR and gRPC are some new libraries for um, real-time communication between various apps. SignalR is really good for real-time communication to browsers, and gRPC is a new standard that's super fast server-to-server -server communication. Then we'll cover some deployment, and there's loads of ways you can deploy .NET Core, but what I'm gonna cover is wrapping it up into a container and deploying that to a containerized architecture. And finally, we're gonna wrap it all up by covering clean architecture, which for us is the best, simplest approach 
to um, build an actual enterprise application. It's all the best practices. Anything you want to add? No, that's there? it. Um, yeah, we've got we've got a, an exciting feature to include with our clean architecture talk today. We're going to keep it simple. Um, we've got we've got the talk on SSW TV, so you can definitely go and check out the full version. Um, and so today we'll we'll cover the basics of clean architecture and then introduce something new that we've built. Awesome stuff. So let's start with getting started. And the first thing is why .NET Core? There's this thing called .NET that's been out for quite a while. <laughs> and um, it's been out since 2002. And it's quite successful, lots of people are using it, lots of people are using it to make their um, business apps. But one thing that stands out with .NET, classic .NET, is it's used to make business apps in kind of mid-tier. It's not used that much for your really big um, applications, your Facebooks and your Twitters. They're not using things like .NET Core, they're, they're very much, oh, sorry, they're not using classic .NET. And the reason for that is it's too slow. Classic.NET has huge amounts of system resources and it was not competing with those really small, really fast open source systems. The other reason .NET Core exists is Azure. Um, if you're unkind, you could say that when Windows or my when Microsoft was running .NET Core on your servers, because you've, you've got a mid-sized mid enterprise, you've got some whole bunch of Windows servers there, and so they've got this product to run apps on those servers, when they're running on your servers, they didn't need to care that much about how small and how fast it was because you just bought the license and you bought the servers. But as soon as they launched Azure and it's Microsoft servers that are there sitting there turning um, money into heat, it suddenly became very important to get .NET smaller and faster and competing and, and you know, being able to act more efficiently. Um, the other answer is there's a whole new Microsoft. Microsoft is embracing open source in many different ways. So the question, if the question is why don't you just open source .NET Framework? Well, they couldn't. It was too, there's too much wrapped up in there. It was developed in a kind of closed source world. So there's too much stuff they'd bought rather than wrote themselves. So a reboot in .NET Core is starting from the ground up, rewriting all the source code and putting all that source code out there on GitHub. And that's the other change is previous versions of Microsoft dabbling in open source, there would be some Microsoft-centric open source library or it'd be on CodePlex. Now with .NET Core, they've gone full open source and it's there on GitHub with the MIT license. So it's not a Microsoft-made license, they're using a well-known, you know, used out in the open source world license. So what does that mean for .NET Core? The .NET Core is optimized for server, for cloud and for containers. Um, because it runs on Linux, now, it runs very well on containers, which is the future of deployment. And it's also much faster, much more efficient. So here's the various versions of .NET Core. We've got .NET Core 1 in 2016. And since then, we've had iterated versions. I think getting to 1 was really painful. Um, anyone that was working on the betas saw huge changes going on in the entire ecosystem as they kind of stabilized towards 1. But since kind of 1 and 1.1 came out, we've seen a very stable increase of more stuff being available, more stuff working. Um, so now we've got .NET Core 3, and what came out with .NET Core 3 was quite a lot of um, extra stuff. So the first versions of .NET were very much focused on web servers. We want web services, REST APIs, MVC websites. Let's get that stuff, which is what people want to host on Azure, working first. With .NET Core 3, we're getting much more stuff like WPF and Web Forms programs. So not Web Forms, Win Forms programs, that kind of stuff. So about the future of um, .NET. Well, you see there's a kind of a series of milestones here. Um, in December, we're going to get um, .NET Core 3.1, so it's very close. And that will be a long-term support version. So that means that Microsoft expect to support that for a number of years after release date. So that will be a really good version to stabilize on. Then, at some point in the future, we've got this thing, actually not some point, November 2020, it's not that far away, one year, we're getting this thing called .NET 5. What's going on there? So if you're someone that's been sat there on .NET 4 and thinking, wow, this is a, I could move across to .NET 3, .NET Core 3, but why don't I wait for .NET 5 to come along because then it will just work. That is not the case because .NET 5 is taking .NET Core and sticking a .NET 5 badge on it. There might be, there will be some work to reunify and add anything missing, 
but it is not uh, we're going to merge these two streams. It's a closing the .NET 4 branch, and .NET 5 is the future, but it is .NET Core. .NET 5 is still .NET Core, it's just the next version of .NET Core. They just drop the core off the name, and then moving forward from there. Which means we've already seen the end date for classic .NET. Classic .NET is no longer going to be the future of .NET. So introducing the .NET standard. So what is .NET standard? We've got these versions of .NET floating around now. And in fact, even before .NET Core came along, we already had .NET, .NET Compact version. We had Mono that got taken into Microsoft when they realized this is a great tool that people have been writing. It's a version of .NET that runs on um, Unix, which means it works inside phones, so we can actually build phone apps with .NET. So that became Xamarin. And so we've got all these different, and there's UWP as well, it's versions of .NET. All these different versions of .NET floating around, it get really hard to work out, if I'm running a piece of software, can I run it in that version of .NET? So that's what .NET standard is about. It's not a technology, it's a specification. And basically what it establishes is, at a particular version of .NET standard, it documents all the APIs, all the things I can call in that version. So things like string.format, that's available everywhere. More complicated things won't be available in, in all versions. And here is the grid, basically. Going down this table are all the different versions of .NET, .NET Core, .NET Framework, Mono, various Xamarin versions, UWP, and um, Unity. And then going left are all the different versions of um, .NET Standard. So you can map up the version of .NET Framework to the .NET Standard. So for example, if you've got .NET Framework 4.5, the highest version of .NET standard you can use is 1.1. If you've got 4.6.1, then you can go all the way up to 2. What's interesting is here, if you look at .NET standard 2, then 4.6.1 and over, so 4.7, 4.8, yes, you can use all the APIs in .NET standard 2.0. If you look at 2.1, there's nothing, because .NET framework will not support 2.1. That is the end of the line right there. That's the line drawn in the sand. That's the point that um, the classic .NET framework is gonna stop. So it's clear, it's been released. That's the information. The future is .NET. Okay, this is a big table of information. How do you go about understanding and reading this? Um, well, really, it's all to do with how, what libraries can I use? I wanna use this library in my application. Will it be compatible? So here's an example of a new get page, uh, newinsoft.json. It's the... Um, uh, object to JSON converter, serializer, that's the right name, um, pretty much used everywhere in .NET. If you go to the NuGet page, you see toward the bottom, there's this thing called dependencies. You click that and open it up, and you see a list of all the places that that thing can run. So what you're seeing here is it runs on all the versions of classic .NET framework, and then it lists some stuff about .NET standard. So if your framework supports .NET standard 2, down the bottom, this library will run without installing any other dependencies, it just goes. If you want to run this in .NET Standard 1.0, you need it will work, but it also downloads this, these extra um, NuGet packages in order to make it work. So basically, you browse to the NuGet page, look at dependencies, and if you don't see .NET Standard at all mentioned here, it's probably really old. Look at the last time it was updated, probably not going to work. Do you have a question? Question about .NET Core 3, there's uh, there's some libraries. That's a good question. So you're asking about the JSON library in .NET 3 versus Newton's of JSON. Yeah. Um, well, they say the .NET, the new one in .NET 3 is faster, but I'm very used to JSON. I'm very used to config to the JSON.NET, so I'm not sure which way I'm going to go yet. I will probably try it the next brand new application, and I may well switch to, to Newton's of because I'm used to the, where the configuration settings are. Yeah. But the, I mean, it is faster but I'm not sure if losing the configuration things I'm used to is worth that tiny fraction of um, performance boost. Mm. But if you're looking high performance, then definitely go with the faster one, because they're, they're rewriting it with all the new language features, like span of T and that kind of stuff, where mm. new JSON was made before then. So there's definitely performance improvements from the newest one, but it's not as well tested in the world yet. One of the things that I wanted to try out was um how well it worked with the NSWAG toolchain and generating the open API specifications, because that's obviously an important part. I mean, it's working fine, um, at least, for, the, at least for, for my test cases. So that's good. 
So what does it mean with .NET Core? Well, it means you can run anywhere. You can run your .NET applications inside Windows, like you've always been able to, inside Linux or inside Mac. Um, you can also do crazy things like run it inside containers. So um, Docker is the kind of the best way of wrapping up an application and saying, let's deploy this out to server, or let's deploy it out to 50 servers. And then Kubernetes builds into a Docker to actually orchestrate whole farms and architectures and multiple servers all linked together. And because .NET Core works with Linux, it goes to Docker and it goes to Kubernetes much better than any of the Windows container offerings. And finally, you've got loads of options. Here's a uh, screen from um, <coughs> the Azure kind of create me a resource. And you can put .NET inside a Kubernetes service, service fabric, Windows web apps, Linux web apps, function apps, web apps for containers, and finally, if, if you really need to take control of your machine, into a virtual machine. You've got a question. So do I think um, Kubernetes is going to replace web apps? I really think it depends on scale. I think for a lot of applications, you don't need to go all the way through to a Kubernetes system. If you've got you know, one web server or a couple of web servers and you're happy maintaining them, you can use ARM templates to bootstrap a couple of web app containers. Web apps for containers are nice and simple. Kubernetes is complicated, but if you have a certain scale of application of architecture, it becomes worth the effort to go that extra step and go Kubernetes. But um, certainly I wouldn't say oh, everything needs to be on Kubernetes. It's a case of complexity, the complexity of what you're trying to deploy and what you want to do with the things you're deploying once they're up there. If you want to do really you know, next level things like start doing A-B testing or you know, start bringing up 10% of your traffic across while you do a migration and make sure that 10% is good before you cut across, that kind of complexity is better handled by Kubernetes. Where if you're just deploying the latest version to production and you've got you know, one web server or maybe you know, three web servers and a database server and that's it, that's as far as your, your architecture goes, probably web app containers or some kind of web app option is going to be easier to manage. Yes, so the question there was the, the difference between .NET Core and classic .NET is .NET Core lacks some of those OS features. So it has less APIs that talk directly to, to Windows because it doesn't assume that it's running on Windows. So yes, that is the case. There are compatibility packs though. So there's a compatibility pack, the added .NET Core, that gives you some of those features back, like system.directory services. So the early versions of .NET Core didn't really talk Active Directory that well. But there is a compatibility, a compatibility pack that will give you access again to Active Directory. But again, that's only for deploying on Windows. If you take that step, you then can't ship your app to, to other architectures. But you know, so you've got the, the choice there to weigh those up. Also, you can get it to run on uh, Raspberry Pi and very small sort of ARM-based systems. And finally, and um, we'll cover this later, um, one other place you can run .NET is via Blazor inside WebAssembly. And we'll cover this in more detail in the Blazor section. But um, Blazor is kind of experimental technology to compile .NET, put it into WebAssembly inside a browser, and then run .NET inside the browser where you traditionally run JavaScript. Very exciting, and we'll cover that in more detail later. So key points are .NET Core is the future of .NET. So um, I've spoken to a fair few people that are like, well, I'm going to wait and wait to wait until .NET 5 comes out because then that'll be reunified. There is no direct migration from .NET 4 to .NET 5. It is a, well, it's, no, yeah, it's not an upgrade, it's a migration from classic .NET to .NET Core. Um, more and more libraries are coming in to make that um, <coughs> migration easier, to, easier to, to manage. But um, certainly if you upgrade, if you start migrating to .NET Core 3 now, that's not going to be wasted time when .NET 5 comes out because .NET 5 from, from .NET Core 3 will be an upgrade where 4 to 5 is still going to be a migration. So that's the key difference, the difference between an upgrade and a migration. At some point, if you're on classic .NET, you need to do that migration step. Um, .NET Core is cross-platform and open source, runs in many places. And what the .NET standard is for is for actually specifying what stuff you can use. Can I use system.txt.serialize? Can I use system.xml? And it's basically saying, at each version, here's all the things you expect to find that you can run without installing an extra NuGet package to, to, back, to add it. I am in a shell inside a Mac. This could be a shell inside a Linux. This could be a command window inside Windows. All the commands you see are exactly the same. So the first thing I'm going to introduce you to, well, I'm going to create a folder to put some stuff in. And 
I'm going to introduce you to one new command line and that command is called .NET. So you type .NET from the command line and it gives you this information about how to use it. And I can go .NET -h for help and it tells me all the different commands I can run. So it's fairly interactive. Um, but what's crucial here about this command line is that this works everywhere and they, this is the only tool you need to work with .NET. Now, I'm not suggesting everyone, if you're going to be working all day with .NET, just work with this command line and open up text files or learn Vim or something. But what I am saying is you don't need Visual Studio installed to work with .NET. So that means you don't have to get a $1,000 license. You can use the Visual Studio uh, Community Edition, which is free, or you can use Visual Studio Code, which is free, or any text editor you like. Um, the advantages of one that's made for Visual, uh, .NET is it will have C-sharp syntax highlighting, but you don't need those tools to work with .NET, which means when you go to set up continuous integration, so the idea that you check your code into source control somewhere, and an automated process picks that code change up, um, compiles it, and puts it into a server and runs a test against it, and you know, you've got your test site ready to go as soon as you've checked in the work, or within a, a few minutes of checking in the work. That used to be very hard to work, do with classic .NET because Quite often, it was hard to get MS Test to run on a separate server. Like I've countless times, I've actually gone into Visual Studio, grabbed some random DLLs from the guts of a Visual Studio install, and had to copy them up to a comp compilation server just to get my continuous integration process to work. So, because .NET now works completely with a command line first, it um, means you never get those problems again. It's very easy to make a continuous integration server on any on any platform. You just download your code and runs it. The only thing to watch out for if you're going cross-platform is that on Unix or Linux-based systems, um, all file paths are case insensitive. So yeah, case sensitive, well Windows are case insensitive. So that's the only thing to watch for, is just be, be vigilant about your um, case sensitivity on file names. So the next command I'm going to run is the command to create a, um, a project. I'm going to go .NET new, and I'm going to hit nothing. And what I get now it's a list of all the different types of projects <coughs> I can create with this .NET new command. Now what's important here is I can type .NET new from the command line, it'll create me a, a project, and I'll use a project template to do that. I can go in Visual Studio and go file new project, and what I get out of that process is exactly the same code, exactly the same template from those two processes. So doing this from here is exactly the same as using Visual Studio, and I'll show you Visual Studio pretty soon. But the point I'm making here is it's tooling first and then add the kind of Visual Studio tooling on the top rather than we're making Visual Studio first and if you want to do it from the command line, you're stuck. So massive improvement on how things used to be. So the type of pro uh, project I'm going to make is the most simple one. It's a console application. So I type .NET new console. And that runs away, and that creates me a few files. A few more seconds. That's done. So if I look in that folder, I've got a few things. I'll walk through this folder, this folder in a minute. But to run that, I just inside that folder, I'll type .NET run. And it runs that console program. And all it does is say, hello world. Let's take a look at the code for that. There we go, mapping up Visual Studio Code, which is a fantastic free tool. Let's make that full screen. And what, what's been created here is just a couple of files. There is a project file. Now, with classic.net, these project files grew to be very big because what would happen in classic.net with project files is every file you wanted to be compiled, so every CS file in your project, would have to be explicitly listed in this file which meant if you're working in a big team with source control and two people make changes and check that in, chances are there'd be a conflict on that file. You're constantly coming back to here in your source control to merge conflicts because we both added a new file in that, that, that lined up to be in the same code line here. Now in .NET Core, this is much simpler. You don't have to list all the files. You just have to put specific settings. And what you generally put in here, this is where your NuGet package imports land up. So this file is much nicer to work with. The other thing that's great now is um, 
you can work on this file from Visual Studio without having to unload the project. Just right click edit, you can edit in place, hit go, and it will just reload the project automatically. You don't have to unload, edit, and then load back. Pretty much with classic.net, you only touch the CSproj file if it was broken. But now it's actually nice to work with. The other thing I've got here is a classic static void main, like we've always had. So this is how you bootstrap a console application. There is one, prod, one, one method called main that takes in the command line arguments from the command line, and we've got one line of code, console.write line, hello world. So a couple more commands to show you. There is a .NET restore. And that command, when you've got a, a pr program that's got lots of NuGet packages, that'll go and fetch all the NuGet packages and install them. Um, you really need to run that though, because if you do a .NET run, it will um, create that, uh, it will do the restore for you if you need to do so. .NET run, you've already seen, is to, now .NET run is the command that's intended for um, the dev time running. So it will look for source files in your folder, compile them, run them, and, and kickstart the program. So there it goes. So that's still fairly quick, but um, .NET publish and .NET build will actually take your app and publish it up and turn it into a compiled application. Once you've done .NET publish on it, it means you don't need the SDK to run it, you just need the runtime. So you can deploy that to a server and have that run much quicker. So let's take a look at that. If I go .NET publish, give it an output file, but folder, sorry. and run that like that, that'll go in and run it. If I look in that publish file, you can see it's created DLL files and all that stuff. So now if I want to run a published application, it's just .NET and then a reference to the DLL that contains the compiled application. So sydney.dll and this time it won't try and build that application, it'll just run that executable as it finds it, and you'll see that's incredibly fast. So bootstrapping.net is much faster than it used to be. There was a time where it would take a few seconds to spool up any .NET application, it's got sorting things out, but now a compiled .NET application starts lightning quick. So that's getting started with a console application. Let's go beyond there now and start looking at an ASP.NET Core application. So we're gonna open up Visual Studio, we're gonna create a brand new ASP.NET Core application and start looking through the project we get there. So I'm gonna open up Visual Studio, I'm gonna say, create a new project. And inside that project, I'm gonna create a new ASP.NET Core web application. I click next. No, that big blazer. It's been a cool web application. Get out of it. Next. Okay, I'm going to call this um, Sydney Web. I'll give it a location. See the C. That'll do. Now it's asking me for all different types of um, web application I can create. I can create an empty one where it just puts the shell in and lets me set up what I want. You can create an API application, a web application. So that's, that's a web application is more for your classic kind of MVC um, Razor Pages style. Um, that's for more classic Razor Pages. And uh, there's a new thing called Razor Pages. We don't cover it that much, but it's um, it's kind of it's kind of like the ideas of web forms and MVC kind of thrown back together and turned into a, a more this is code for a certain page. Um, which one should I create? Want the Angular one or just go straight for the classic MVC? Let's oh, go MVC. classic MVC. I'll create Angular later. Yeah. And hit create. It's interesting to note that. Um, Classic MVC is no longer the default choice, so it is the new Razor Pages syntax that's the default choice, and um, 
definitely the, the, the way that they're driving it. And you see how when they're using it with tools like Blazor, um, that it's definitely the way they want to go forward. Um, Damien Edwards, who was, who was kind of instrumental in creating it, I think he called it his baby, um, said that this is the way we should have done it in the first place. Yeah, yeah I was going to mention him. Mm. If any MVC page, if you go and add um, identity stuff to it now and get that kind of generated for you login page, um, that will be a Razor page mm. rather than an MVC action with, with separate mm. systems in there. Okay, so let's take a look at what we've got here now. So this is the brand new application we've got created. It's been created for us by ASP.NET. I think the first thing I'll show you is when we actually right click and look at that project file. Wow, that's not got any, any um, APIs in there. I don't expect to see some more stuff in there. What's Still in pretty your, empty. What's in your controllers? Oh, okay. Yeah, quite yeah. empty. Yeah. I'm surprised. I, I expect to see, so I was going to show you some um, uh, stuff being pulled in, some uh, dependencies. Well, I'll go back on that. Okay, let's start at the very beginning because anyone who's here worked with classic um, .NET full framework code? Quick show of hands, most people. Okay, so when you work with classic .NET full framework web application, there was a whole bunch of stuff pulled in here. There was files like global.asax for setting up stuff. There was a web.config file. And the web.config file is there because it tells IIS how to kind of bootstrap that application in. in. Well, that's all gone. And the main reason that's gone is because there is no assumption you're going to be running this under IIS. You can't. IIS doesn't exist for .NET, um, sorry, it doesn't exist for uh, Linux or Mac OS. So in order to make .NET Core properly um, cross-compatible, they had to rip out all that assumption that you're running under IIS. So it's no longer using, that's the change system.web, it's fundamentally different, that's gone. And you can run this under RAS and you can put a web.config file to configure that, but it's not the default. The default is, here it is, um, waiting for you to run. So global.asax and web.config used to be how it was bootstrapped because the way it worked under IIS is IIS the process to kick off, and at some point IIS maps to this thing called isapi.dll, which is the thing that kind of kick bootstraps any um, application into, under IIS. So you'd be playing with that to run PHP, for example, on, on Windows. And then finally, once you got to isapi.dll, then you'd be bootstrapping applications. So uh, IAS be doing a whole bunch of work on that request before it even gets to your code. Now that's gone. So where, how does this application start? And if I go to program.cs, you'll see a really um, familiar command line here. You're seeing a public static void main. And where have we seen that? Well, we've seen that in any console program. Who can guess why there's a public static void main for this application? Because not not just because so you can uh, it's a good uh, so you can run a command line as well. That's true, but also the fact is this is a console application. There is no difference between this and any other console application. What it is is a console application that has got a whole bunch of extra libraries attached to it that lets it run a web server. So where is the web server? The web server is inside this application. There is no external web server running. It's got a new web server called Kestrel that is actually bootstrapped inside this process. So let's take a look at that. <coughs> I'm just going to build this. I'm going to open up that in a command line window. So I'll show you when you run this application, you've got the option to run it in IS Express, classic stuff, or you can click here and go the name of the thing, and that from here will run it standalone. Or I'm going to show you running it standalone just from the command line. It's no difference. So here I am in the install program. And if I just type .NET run, You should see it compile and start running my application. Eventually. And you see, now listening on port 5001 and port 5000. So that's this application itself has connected to ports 5001 and 5000 on localhost, 
they're now waiting for connections. So now if I browse to here and go localhost, if I could spell. There is running application. And that's a pretty empty default application. I can click around, it's got a few pages. Not that interesting. But if I then come to here and hit control and C, that stops the application. If I come back here and restart this application, it's gone. So it's that simple. It's a console program that runs its own web server. And that web server is called Kestrel and there's various options you can feed in to um, control that Kestrel web server. And that's basically what's going on here is this is only available because we've pulled in this ASP.NET call it hosting and these DLLs. We've got these using statements to pull that stuff in. And then we've got this that just sets up, bootstraps a web server inside our console application. So that's what this chunk of code does, basically. We've got two lines, that just calls this, and this just says, right, bootstrap the application. You've got various options to put in here. If I wanted to change the port, for example, I could go web builder. <coughs> got various settings in here. I can go configure Kestrel, and then in there I can, I can tell which IP address to listen to. Um, whether I'm using HTTPS or not. So it's all kind of built in from that endpoint. You rarely need to change that though, so let's put that back. But what's really important is this line here, this thing called startup. So you'll see this in every single um, ASP.NET Core application. Where this is your file, so your program file is your real top level, your entry point. We're starting a console app and just happens to be when we start that console app, we're going to kick stuff to web stuff. Startup is where I actually program up or configure that web stuff. So inside startup.cs is all the stuff about running an ASP.NET.co web application versus this is just the bit that starts a console application and it just happens to be a web application. So let's take a look in startup. Startup's probably the most important file to work with when working with ASP.NET Core. So the program, you may occasionally want to do some stuff in here, maybe you're tweaking the, the website a bit or maybe uh, setting in some really early stuff at startup, but generally what you work with is this startup file. The job of the program is to start the program and feed you to the startup. The startup file is where it all happens. Okay, the first thing to look at is you get injected this configuration system. So this is how you get to read anything going on from your configuration engine. And ASP.NET Core has a wholly over, um, re, re implemented um, configuration system. So what we used to have was web.config. So in web.config, you could put some app settings, you could put some name equals values stuff, or you could get complicated and make a whole chunk of JSON to put in a custom section somewhere inside your web.config, and then write lots of code to kind of serialize that out and work with it. It's not, not trivial. What we've got instead is this thing called appsettings.json. And appsettings.json is a JSON file. Um, that means it's smaller, faster to read, but it also means you've also got some great um, rules around here. Um, you can make your own configuration structure anywhere you want inside that JSON file, and it's very easy to read those settings back out. You can read out those settings individually, one string at a time, or you can take a whole chunk, say like this, and cast it to an object. If you create an object in C-sharp, and say, okay, there's a property called log level, and underneath log level is there's a string called default, a string called Microsoft, and a string called Microsoft hosting the lifetime. It's very easy to map that into an object and then send that object around your S3 application. So you can very quickly build up custom configurations. What also happens is when you bootstrap the application, it can take these app settings from a number of places. So the very first starting point is app settings.json. Then you've got one magic in, uh, environment variable called ASP.NET Core underscore environment. And by default, that is called development. So what happens is it loads all the settings from appsettings.json, and then it'll pick up overriding settings, overridden settings from the next one. So if you've got one called appsettings.test, that'll be the one that picks up on your test server, appsettings.production, it'll apply all those things on production. To demonstrate how flexible this can be, I'm going to talk about a problem that I quite often see, um, certainly when working in a team. Surely some of you have seen this. Um, you work in a team, 
and everyone's got the same connection string, it's working great. And then one member of your team goes and works another project for a week. And when they work on that project, they had to do maybe work with um, reporting services or something. And they needed a different version, so they installed reporting services to a different um, uh, connection string. At some point, they've broken their uh, original connection string. They can no longer use the same connection string as everyone else on the team. That's a nice scenario, but there's a simpler scenario. Yeah. You're a member of a team, yeah. and someone's using a Mac. Yeah, yeah, that can be different as well. Yeah. And who would be that guy? <laughs> right? <laughs> Imagine. I would never use a Mac, no. but I convinced you to get one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so there's someone on your team that needs to have a different connection string. And so what they do is they go and change the connection string in the web.config file, and then every now and then they forget and accidentally check that in. And every time they get their changes, they have to go, oh, you've broken the connection string again. It just wastes everyone's time. So let's have a look at a really quick fix you can do with um, ASP.NET Core. This isn't something we picked up from any, any libraries. It's just like, oh, I can see how this is set up. So what you can do is you go into that create host builder in program.cs there, and you add this line here, add JSON file appsings.local.json, optional true, and reload unchanged. So that means in the, in the stream of <coughs> looking for files to apply settings from, I've just added one extra file in there. Second step then is I set my git um, ignore, or whatever, yeah, yeah, yes, everyone's using git these days, set your git ignore to not check that local file in. So I've now got a file on my computer that I can override any setting I like, and it won't get checked in when I check into the source code, and so now we can have um, per user config in there, and still have the um, environment level and um, other settings going on as well. Another thing that's important here is there are not just files, environment variables can override. That's really important because when you want to deploy your application around, um, environment variables are a very good way of setting things. And by giving a long name with delimiters, you can drill down right into configuration and override anything at any, any level depth. So if you just put a colon in there, so you know, uh, say for example, um, connection strings dot default connection string, that will just drill down in and set just that connection string. Um, so that's really important for um, things like Docker containers, because one of your primary ways of tweaking configuration inside Docker containers is to send it a whole bunch of environment variables. And so that's very easy to do in .NET Core, which is very hard to do in classic .NET. So let's walk through that um, file a bit more. And we have covered the um, configuration. So the question was, what's involved in running under IIS? In fact, very easy to run under IIS. You um, add a web.config file, and we've got a slide in this later, and that web.config file will just set up the proxy. So you've got two ways of running now. Um, the first and default way, which you set up IIS, and it runs as a proxy. There's a specific um, new uh, plugin to put onto IIS for .NET Core that will then proxy connections from IIS through to your running .NET Core program. And then I think it was 2.1 or 2.2, they added a um, in-process mode. So you can take .NET Core and run it in process just like it used to for any application. Do you always start with one file and then make your app settings.json for the other environments override. So they override the settings. You start with a base file and then you can have an app settings dot test dot json that has just one setting in it because that's anything that needs to change so you don't have to copy the whole thing it's not using xml transforms like the old system used to do you don't have to run any of that process it's just here's a file here's a file that overrides it and here's some con here, and finally here's some environment variable settings that overrides all of that and it's just very easy to, to handle so yes yeah, so you i would i would develop and have one base setting and have one file per environment for all the for all the main stuff then secrets um, you've got a secret engine locally to put in your, your kind of passwords and stuff. And then Azure Key Vault, for example, is a great way of pasting in your connection strings and keeping them out your source code. Okay, so moving down, after configuration, we have this section called Configure Services. And so Configure Services is all about setting up your dependency injection framework. Quick show of hands, who's using dependency injection? Most of you. I'm going to have a quick demo on that anyway, because it's, it's worth, worth covering, covering again. And um, the key thing with .NET Core is dependency injection is in there as a first-class citizen from the start, rather than it being an idea that was bolted onto the side 
afterwards. So when .NET Core 1 and 1.1 came out, the .NET world wasn't really using dependency injection. Um, it was getting popular in Java, it was starting to take off, but um, it wasn't really a concept that was crucial or used a lot, which meant that if you wanted to take various libraries and kind of push them together into the dependency injection, it was hard because a lot of libraries you were putting in were not written from the start assuming dependency injection was there. And when I say the assuming dependency injection is there, to write dependency injection friendly code is to write services that expect to receive their configuration as constructor parameters. Let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to make a service. I'm going to call it add service. And my add service is going to have a single function. It's going to return an int, and it's going to have a function called add, and it's going to take in int a, and it's going to take in int b, and what's it going to, what it, it's going to, I'll make that public, I think you can guess what's going to happen inside this function, or method. It's going to return A plus B. So this isn't the great, greatest service in the world, but it's to demonstrate a piece of functionality I'm going to share around my applications, a service that does a thing for me. Okay, so let me create an endpoint to use that service. Let's go into my home controller. Inside my home controller, I'm going to create a new thing. <coughs> Let's call it add. Give it a route. Let's use double quotes because I'm not in JavaScript. It's looking good. Okay, so I'm going to do something inside this ad. I'm going to return. Okay, so at this point, I have got set up a small um, endpoint here. So this route system will say if the if .NET receives a request to slash add, it's going to run this action endpoint. And what it's going to do is do some work. So I am going to. I need to get a, a reference to that service. So one thing I can do is go. Okay, I need the add service, and I go var service equals new add service. That works. And now I can go, okay, return s dot add two and two. Okay, return okay. S dot add two point two. So that's returning an action result. So okay is the action result it says status code two hundred, it's all working, and then what it's gonna return is the result of this add. I'm gonna add two numbers. What we'll I expect to see is four. So let's run this. Let's make sure this is closed. That's closed. Let me, uh, that's right. So control F5. It's going to run my application. Hopefully. Application is running. If I go to slash add. Okay, I've added two numbers and returned four. So I've made something work, great. But what I've done here is something called tight coupling. This piece of code here that, that, that invokes the service has been tightly coupled to this particular version of the add service. If I wanted to test a different service, inject a different version for testing, I can't. And also, um, what if this service I'm using has its own dependencies? So we've said that this piece of code here has a dependency on add service, but what if add service didn't just add two numbers, it had to go and load a tax system and say, okay, what's the tax um, code in our area and how much tax should we apply? And so we needed to have other dependencies on top. Well, for this system to use that, I need to know all the dependencies to feed to add service in order to then use that service. So it's then tightly coupled to even more systems. So what we do with dependency injection, instead of saying, 
I'm going to make the service I need. I'm instead going to create a constructor. The expression they use for that kind of um, situation is new is glue. So it's kind of a code smell. That's great, it's saying new is mm. glue. I'm not going to bother with it. Uh, I'm going to go private read only I add service. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my service and I'm going to declare an interface for it. And that service is going to have a single method. And then I'm going to say that this add service implements my add service. Okay, so what I've done is I've created an interface and says anything that implements the iAd service interface has this shape. It has a method called add that takes in two integers and returns an integer. I have now said my concrete class, the implementing actual real service, does the actual work, returns A and B. So then inside my home controller, I am going to wire this up. Here's a little trick. Um, initialize from the local constructor. That's a resharper feature. It'll take a local property you've declared and then feeds it in as a constructor parameter. So what's this? This is the home controller. This is the constructor for this class home controller, which is the controller that is going to catch these um, requests coming in. And what we've done is we've declared our dependency, the thing we need for this to work, as a constructor parameter. So instead of saying down here, manually create the thing I need, I am telling the framework I need something that looks like this, something that <coughs> has this I add service interface. Then instead of declaring it here, I can go, okay, I can say underscore add service dot add. So now I have decoupled my, my application. This no longer knows all the details of the service it needs. It just is declaring it needs some form of ad service. It's not my job to know what ad service needs to get working. I just need to know that I need an ad service of some kind. Then this section here is all about setting that up. So in my startup, I've got this configure services. I can say services dot add transient, which is the easiest one. I add service. You need to specify the implement. Yeah. yeah. Add service. So what this configuration says is when the fr I ask the framework to give me an I add service, feed in add service. What's useful here is if I'm writing test code, and we'll show this a bit later as well, if I'm writing a unit test around this, I can inject in a fake version of my add service and test just the code under test and um, sort of write unit tests that don't depend on certain services because some of these services are big and write to databases or you know read from a file or connect to external dependencies. So with that in place, if I then run that, we should see that my ad system still works. Does it remove the need of ninjets and um, that kind of thing? I'll come to that right now actually. So I'm going to cover a couple more things and then I'll take in the, the external ninjet provider question. So providing different implementations of the service based on input, um, you can, for that level of complexity, I would bring in a third party like Autofac. Autofac has a concept of named things, but generally you want, a, yeah, it depends on your use case. Um, you can give certain, yeah, you can actually ask for certain implementations by name. Or generally, you, you want to resolve to one name as your default one, but you might, there might have to be a decorator pattern going on to actually build up one with more and more features. So that's one way to go. There was a really great blog post written on that recently. Um, if you go to rdallas.com and click on blog. Should I bring this up? Uh, yep, yeah, you can do that. So just click on blog on the left there. Scroll down until you see configure different implementations for different controllers and configure services. And oh, there we go, yeah. Um, so, so this is talking about different implementations of repositories. 
Um, but that'll definitely answer your question. Okay. Okay. So we've seen one thing, services to add transient, this service. Now add transient means every time the framework's asked for a service, it'll create a new one there on the spot. So every single use will be a new instance of that thing. Sometimes you've got um, services to use that are quite expensive to bootstrap. So maybe you want to have it one of those for the lifetime of the application. And that's where services dot add singleton, because what I just described is a singleton pattern. And finally, there's a third one. Um, sometimes you want something to live a little bit longer, but not too long. And that's what services.addScoped is. So services.addScoped will be scoped by default in ASP.NET to per request. So you can create your own scopes with a using statement, or you can just go per request. So it means, for example, your DB context, which will come to an entity framework, that's great for being a per request. You want it to kind of live a little bit longer so that you can use it for the lifetime of your request, but you want to make sure it's nicely closed at the end of the request. So that's where services to add scoped comes in. Another way to use this, well, quite often if you're using a, a, a library, um, you'll go to that front page of that library and it'll tell you how to use this library and there'll be a couple of commands. Generally, um, the thing you want to use will have an extension method added to this our service collection. So you'll have services dot add, and you can see there's quite a few different things in here, like add authentication. That wires in all the depend dependency injection stuff to put authentication in there. Or you can add cause, add health checks, add identity, add logging. So basically, any library you want to pull in will generally give you an extension method that just sets this up and wires it in. So you do much less manual wiring up your dependency injection because most of the third-party APIs you pull in will give you the command to put in here and just wire themselves up. You can also build your own extension methods and wiring your own stuff that way. The other thing to, to look at, so generally I find most of my code, I don't need to... Um, use a more complicated dependency injection system because most stuff I can just wire up here. Um, occasionally though you do, a really key example is say using the repository pattern, you've got a whole bunch of repositories you want to wire up, then um, then I'd put in autofac and then use autofac to do an assembly scan, put in all the things of this class that override this class for example. Then, um, then I'd pull in uh, dependency injection via autofac and Autofac is very easy to wire up. You just go to the Autofac page, find the Autofac thing for the request you want. And basically what happens with the dependency injection third party systems now is they actually work with this. So you don't get a situation where you get half your configuration in Autofac and half your configuration here. You let Autofac do its thing. It will put in all the stuff that's been configured by Autofac. And then it will take that and this configuration, wrap them up into one, and you have one container with all your all resources declared in there. So it's not an either or, you actually, Autofac and, and other third party dependency injection systems will just give you more configuration options to wrap it all up and wire it into this one dependency injection system, yeah. So it works really nicely, really transparent. So that's the, configure services. The other thing you can do is there's, an, um, there's a GitHub repo which actually provides extension methods to the built-in dependency injection. So that's spelled um, S-C-R-U. Yeah, that's it. So it's called Scrutal, and basically it provides two um, capabilities. One is an extension method for um, assembly scanning, and the other one is extension method for decorating. So if all you're looking for is assembly scanning, so in Brennan's example, yeah. wiring up a whole bunch of repositories with their default implementations, this will do it for you just via an extension method. Okay, so moving on, so where configure services is all around your dependency injections, so services you can inject into your controllers or into whatever code you want. Um, configure is all about configuring the rest of the ASP.NET pipeline. And what's crucial about this whole configure system is no behavior operates in an ASP.NET core application that isn't explicitly wired up in this configure. So what we're doing here is configuring up all the different handlers, all the different pieces of thing that can run in response to your request. And that includes um, things like static files. <coughs> your ASP.NET web application will not serve static files from your folders unless you have app.use static files. Um, HTTP redirection, that's all about, we have a 
non-secure request coming in. That one says always redirect it to a secure request and we have security turned on by default. Then we're turning on things like routing and authorization. We also have this thing called endpoints, which we'll touch on briefly in a minute. Um, we also have this thing called middleware. So anyone that's used the Owen stuff from the classic .NET will be familiar with this. It's the idea of middleware is this really low level chain of events you can plumb into the request pipeline that's much quicker and simpler and happens before any MVC kicks off. Now MVC is the classic um, model view controller thing for .NET, that's still there. But MVC has got quite a bit of overhead. It kickstarts the MVC engine, it's got its own, it's got a routing system that kicks in, it's got um, a bunch of filters you can apply. So you can put filters into the MVC pipeline. But middleware is really low level before even that. And middleware is as simple as app.use. I can put in a context and a next. Now with this stuff, the order of where you put stuff is important. So stuff you put, anything that matches the response earlier up in this chain, that'll be the thing that returns. So what I've got here is I've written a bit of middleware that's gonna happen after static files, but before this use endpoints is mapping up my MVC endpoints, and it's gonna say every single request that comes in, I'm just gonna turn the string handled by middleware. So if I run that, you'll see I've completely changed my web application to be a really simple one that instead of any of the requests I've asked for, it's just gonna say handled by middleware. Let that go. So if I reload that, handled by middleware. Any requests I put in, it's just gonna immediately come back and say handled by middleware. Try that again. Yeah. So what that, that's useful for is for really low level stuff. Now you don't have to make one that terminates. You've also got this little next thing. So that next is the callback to run next the rest of the, of the chain. So you can actually build middlewares that for example, add headers or correlation IDs or you know, add, add, add headers or cookies or anything else into the chain. Something you want to you apply universally to all, um, all requests. And if you do that, you just call next rather than returning a response. Yeah. Because maybe it's because it's before the add routing. Basically, it was trying to match the route, didn't find a route, so that was kicking off. So if I move this to the top now, and make that the first thing. Yeah, I tried to fudge that, and then you saw it. So that let me do, I think if I put it there, it will then ignore the route, because now it's before the routing engine kicks in. Let's see if that's right. You shouldn't this, be is a, this is a good demo, if actually You, you, if you shouldn't works. be fudging anything. No. You've got how many hours sleep? <laughs> it was six. So it's that app.run as well, right? That Mine hours. Yes, yes, app.run. So uh, app.use is use middleware, app.run does it. There's also app.map that lets you run middleware, but only if the incoming request maps a certain thing. So now if, it doesn't matter what I put in here. So if I go add three, that works because now it's before the routing. If it's after the routing, it runs the routing bit first and so tries to matching up, map up the routes. So the key thing there, that's a great demo, where you put this, is really important, and if you get to this point, that means it, this is going to overtake, overtake the entire request. So middleware is really good, and middleware is what they're using to get those really, really high throughput mess, um, tests when they're doing performance tests. They're not bootstrapping, you know, they're doing performance tests where they're getting millions of requests per second just on returning a string. Um, to do that, they're not running the whole MVC architecture, they're using middleware to kind of short circuit that and give you really quick responses. Um, the other thing to look for, and I'll just mention it, is you've got this new endpoint system here. So previously you pulled in MVC, and you'd get this routing engine, and it would match things like, by default, it matches the first bit to the controller name, the second bit to the action name, and you've got an optional ID. So for that means, on my home controller here, the um, slash privacy matches to this one, it turns the uh, MVC view for privacy. 
Um, but what in previous versions, all the way up to ASP.NET Core 2.2, there was an issue in the MVC had this nice routing engine where you can map incoming requests and attach behavior. But then there was uh, various other engines like SignalR routes, gRPC routes, and middleware routes. They didn't share the same routing system, so it's really hard to do things like attach uh, authentication. So the way you lock down a MVC route is you can come in here and you can stick an authorize tag on it. And once you put <coughs> authorize here, <coughs> Once you put that authorized attribute against this endpoint, it means you can't hit that endpoint if you're not logged in. Or I can take this authorized attribute and put it against the top of the, the controller, then all the routes handled by that controller, you're now required to be logged in. But what they found it was easy to do MVC routes that way. There was no good way of taking a middleware route or taking a signal R route. Um, one thing that drove the addition of um, endpoints was at some point they added this app dot add health checks, I think it was called. Use? You probably use health checks, isn't it? Use health checks. So what that does, it adds a kind of health check endpoint, so that when you're running on a server farm, all the different, the um, load balancer for the server farm can ping your application and ask, are you alive? Um, they added that, and it was great, but then a customer turned around and said, but I want to lock down my um, use health checks page. I want everyone to see how many of, whether my database is working. I just want it local. And there was no good way of taking that app that use health checks configuration and just adding, ah, oh, this one's authorized on top. They had to write some custom middleware looking for the certain URL coming in and then run mid the authorization code. And so it was uh, difficult. So what this new endpoint system does is it decouples the concept of incoming routes from MVC and gives you this new concept of locking down any route. So it could work for a signal R route, a middleware route, or a gRPC route, which we'll cover later. And that's the endpoints. Okay, I'm gonna show you the next thing I'm gonna show you is a little bit of logging. So there's been various logging systems for .NET. There was log for net very early on, which was copied over Java one. There was nlog. Then we got serial log, which was great. Serial log introduced the idea of um, structural logs. And now the new, the latest, the version that's inside .NET Core now, they have their own R log interface that uh, supports structural logs. Now I'll explain what a structural log is. I'm gonna come into our add command. So I come into my add, my home controller. And I'm just going to create a new object just to test with. I'm creating an object here just to kind of give you something to work with. I could have done this with tuple, but it wouldn't make a good demo. So prop int a. So create a class that basically holds a structure that has two numbers. Just like that. So here is a just a, almost a DTO really. It's just an, an, an object that has a structure. It's got two numbers inside it. And I want to log that so I can say and you can see the logger is injected as a constructor parameter. And when we inject it in, we just we reference the type of log it's for that helps um, decorate the log. And so this interface now, by default, is available for us. Remember, all I did was .NET new, a file new project. We've got this logger wired in. And that's our logger interface. We can now write logs with that logger. And the logs we can make are, we can go log.information log.debug, log.trace, the so various log levels that we can then configure to come through. So information is quite a high level one. There's also um, fatal warning and error in various levels. A equals 
to b equals to. Obviously, in a real world example, I'd probably already have this object that I'm working with. I'm just showing you how you can create an object and send that object into your logs. That's looking about right. So let's have a look at that again. Oh. We've got this log.information. And rather than just building a string, I'm actually building a string, but then with this reference here, and actually the name is just what gets sent to the logs, I can actually send in a full object into my log. So that's structural logging. So structural logging lets me take objects and send objects into log, not just build a string and only log the string. If I'm going to run that as it is, let's uh, do that now. As it is, it's not that powerful because it depends on what you're logging to as to what they can do with that. So at the moment, I've got some logging, and it's only logging to text here, one of these. If I then go and run the add. That did the adding, which you should see towards the bottom here. One of these has got it, and you see this log isn't telling me much because this particular log output to console isn't handling that um, structure very well. There is something that can handle that structure much better, and that's a program called Seek. It's not Southeast Queens and Water. You gotta go for the data last one. So Seek is a service that can capture and index logs and then let you search those logs. Um, you can, it's also got SQL style syntax for drilling through those logs with a SQL syntax and actually building reports or helping you, you find stuff. So I've already got Seek installed, so I'm going to start by installing Seek. So Seek's just an installer. I've run it, so if I go to services, and then find Seek, starts with S. I'm just going to start that. So that's just running the installer from the website. I've installed and run Seek. Then I need to do a little bit of work to install Seek into my application. <coughs> and for that, I'm just going to go to there, getting started. Further instructions. Okay, so to get started, I need to install the SIG server, which I've done. Then I need to, using ASP.NET Core, that sounds like us. So there is a interface, uh, a library, a, a library called seek.extensions.logging. And then I need to just wire in this code. So I'll grab the code, then remember seek.extensions.logging. So I go to here. A number of ways I can do this, I'm going to do it the easy way. Right click, manage NuGet packages. Then I'm going to browse and type seek.extensions.logging. That's the one. Click that. <coughs> Click install. Then pulls in lots of dependencies. I just accept where they go. That is done. Then with that in place, that was in configure services. So here's another example of um, services.add myself. So we come in here, now that's installed. If I go to my startup file, and most libraries are installed by installing a NuGet package, then doing something in the startup file. So if I go into my configure services here, B, so let's add logging, it's asking me to import, now do you want it? Alt, enter. That's done it, services to add seek. Okay, so let's run that again. <coughs> Close down all these in case the old one's conflicting. I'm going to build it again. Let's go 
it's running, there it is running. So then go to slash add. Endpoint added, added four. Let's take a look at seek now. So seek gives your interface at localhost. Five three four one. That's just its port number. So here's a user interface I can now <coughs> use to browse all my logs. But beyond that, I can actually dig through. And you can see if I click on this particular log, here's the log of that thing I added, added numbers. You can see it's actually taken that object I fed it and serialized it out to JSON. So I can actually drag right down into any object I've logged and get the JSON out. Beyond that, I can also do things like, all right, let's find all the endpoints that had a number in there. Or I can say, that maybe. There you go, it's actually drilled down into that rich object and filtered out objects that had the value 2 in numbers to add. You can see I had one today and then one on um, Tuesday. You've also got things like um, a request ID. So that request ID is logged against every single log event that happens for that request. So if I click on that one and click tick find. I've now got all the events that are raised handling that one request. I can also drill down per user. So when I have a user phone me up and ask me about a bug that just happened, I actually drill down and if the user's logged in, you'll have user IDs logged here. I could then filter down and look at all the work a single user did. Some three or four clicks from actually drilling down lots of logs, just drilling down, optimizing and finding my way to um, logs that just happened. So that's really powerful, and that is Seek, S-E-Q, by a Brisbane guy, Nick Blumhart. Okay, I think we've looked at a bunch of stuff, and we've introduced a lot of concepts. Um, I think we're almost through our getting started section. Let me just confirm what I've looked at. We looked at dependency injection, service lifetimes, logging. So let's go straight to key points, and we'll be going to the next section fairly soon. Yeah, well, coffees will be arriving shortly, and we'll, then we'll break for morning tea. So, key points. Web applications are just console applications with more libraries wired in. No longer are you assuming you're going to be running this custom code underneath IIS. It's fully decoupled. In fact, web applications bootstrap their own inbuilt web server called Kestrel, uh, which means you're totally broken free from IIS, which means you're free to deploy under lots of different scenarios. But IIS is still available. If you want to run under IIS, you can run it IIS as a proxy, or you can run IIS in process. Dependency injection is everywhere in ASP.NET Core, which means the best part of this, it means that when you go and use a library found on the web or found in NuGet into your application, it's already set up for dependency injection. It's assuming it's going to be there. You don't have to jump through hoops to get that stuff to work. You've got a very flexible configuration system. You can override your configuration with adding a new file, or you can inject in uh, environment variables, or from command line switches. It's very easy to override things and just tweak it. So you can build it once, deploy it to many different places, just with um, uh, environment variable overrides, if that's what you want to do. And you've got this powerful request handling pipeline. You can bootstrap the entire of um, the MVC architecture, or you can make a really small system that just has a few endpoints that actually deal with them with middleware and deal with them very quickly. And structured logging is amazing for getting detailed, rich logs, certainly when coupled up with Seek. And you can also plug in that to um, Application Insights as well. We generally find Seek is best for your um, dev and test environments. When you go to actually production, if you're on Azure, Application Insights and things like, what's the other one, Raygun. We find those are a bit better for error handling. <laughs>